This one is how to outline part one. I want to talk about how to add cases to an outline. Part two and later sections will discuss macrostructure, but what I want to do here is discuss microstructure for outlining. So this is a question that we commonly get here at Seven Stage. A lot of people brief cases. We have videos and lengthy explanations about why the worst thing you could possibly ever do is brief cases. So a good question is, what am I supposed to do instead? Our answer is you start outlining from the beginning and you add short case parts to your outline. So you're going against the conventional wisdom in two ways. You're starting outlining from the beginning of the semester instead of waiting to the end. Everyone tells you that you want to wait until later to let it all come together. I think that's a bunch of BS. You can start outlining from the beginning and then you can still restructure things at the end to see how it all fits together. The second part, and this is what this video focuses on, is going against your old training and outlining in what I will call reverse order. What do I mean by that? Normally, I think this is how people add cases to an outline. They will start with the case name, maybe the jurisdiction and the year, because that's how they see them in other outlines, and then kind of a lengthy discussion of the facts here. This is ripped from the original Dark Knight comic books, not the movie, but Batman puts on a powered armor suit. I hope this is actually in the upcoming Batman versus Superman movie. That's how much of a geek I am. But Batman puts on a powered suit and he plugs it into the entire city electrical grid to fight Superman. Then his wee-wee gets electrocuted when he pisses his pants upon seeing Superman really angry. I'm sure that's something no one wants to see. Based on that, he sues the manufacturer of the powered armor suit. Now, if you've ever seen the Wild E. Coyote cartoons, you know that Batman was an idiot for buying anything from Acme Corp. But that's neither here nor there. Then you'll see in this little thing, the holding is here. Batman assumed the risk of wetting himself while wearing inherently dangerous powered armor. To me, this encapsulates two different wrongful mindsets. The first is it's kind of an undergrad view of names, dates, and places. The Christopher Columbus in 1492 and all of that. Here, implicitly, the way this is written, the most important thing is the name of the case and the jurisdiction and the year and then the facts. And the very last thing is the holding. Secondly, this is sort of a mini case brief, right? There's a holding here, there are facts. And all you've really done is stripped out maybe the procedural posture and kind of a lengthier treatment of the facts and maybe the dissent. You got to throw all of that out. This is not designed to help you later on on your exams. It's not in the order of actual importance to somebody taking an issue spotting exam. So this is how you actually do it. These are kind of general guidelines. You've got to create a generalizable legal rule coming from the case first. Then you drop a line about the facts. And even the name of the case is not important. Because imagine yourself looking through a page full of these when you're faced with a new set of facts on products liability. The first thing you have to word through Batman versus Acme Corp, Southern District of New York, 2014. Those aren't the most important things about that little case squib. So as you're drafting, adding to your outline, you got to think to yourself, you're sending a message to future you during exam, future Marty McFly. How are you going to make those two lines that you add to the outline really count in a way that'll help yourself find claims and defenses in a fact pattern. So I took the liberty of rewriting that little fact pattern this way. You start with a two or one word disposition. There's no liability to Acme. Then the generalizable rule is buyer assumes risk for dangerous product, even as to unforeseen but normal mishaps. Now, no one's gonna say that the suit was designed for people to piss their pants. But that's the key. That's the generalizable rule that you'll take from this. And it'll apply even if you don't have a powered suit in Batman in the fact pattern that you're facing. That's what's useful to you on an exam. And that's exactly what this piece of crap is missing. Then you have the name. It's the very last thing. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the disposition and the rule. Then notice the last thing here is a quick reminder of the facts because you'll remember Batman pees and electrocute self. That's pretty memorable. If you've read the case, a short summary of the facts will trigger enough of a memory for you to know what's going on. In case 
you need to say this is quite like when Batman peed himself. If it's an electrical car that's full of dynamite and it's not equipped for somebody to pee in the seat, you know, then then you might make a, a quick analogy here. But if it's not really close to that, but it's in general that you're using the case, this generalized statement will help you. So let's review. This is the algorithm for adding a case to an outline. Disposition. This is one word. Okay, sorry, one or two words, nothing more. Generalizable legal rule. One sentence case name. You might even just put Batman if there are no other Batman cases, and you don't need jurisdiction or year. And then a short summary of the facts, one to two sentences. This is how you outline. Now, the next step is learning how to fit these into coherent outline, but that's for part two, three, four, five, or however many I come up with.